take this tour we yeah. pass through this technology it's a new technology in the country yeah but not even in the region yeah so we want the viewers to get to know about pit yes to power yes so where we are I think this is the starting point. That's Run great. Through what we see. Okay, so what we're seeing here is two um, uh, fields that we're harvesting for the fuel at the moment. There's a 49 hectare field and a 21 hectare field. We uh, started on the 21 field, and you, as, as you can see, like you can see from the other side on Burundi, how this uh, Burundi side, how this field looked before we started. So it's, it's uh, vegetation grass where people are farming or cutting grass for their cows. But underneath is peat. So peat is basically uh, decomposed ma uh, material uh, over millions of years. Uh, settles in the valleys, uh, all the valleys in the Rwanda. Rwanda has many. Um, and it uh, settles in the bottom and decomposes. And then this is highly combustible material. Like, uh, it's equivalent to coal. So coal is a fuel which is um, uh, compressed, um, to, you know, lots and lots of times, like diamonds, to make a, a fossil fuel. Whereas this is uh, basically coal which is on the surface, which has not been compressed. It's decomposed material in the valley. So it's like a farming technique. You um, uh, basically cut the grass off the top because it's a bog, it's, it's uh, wet material, so you have to dry it. So you make channels um, in the peat and then uh, dries in the sun and you keep cutting, it keeps drying and when it's dry enough for the exact right moisture for the boiler, then you take it off um, and take it to the power plant. Oh, all right. So looking at peat, peat in Rwanda, how much in terms of deposit are we talking about? I, I have absolutely no idea, <laughs> but I know we have 40,000 hectare concession okay. uh, for the for supply of the fuel, which is calculated to be enough uh, about 40 years worth of generation, a full load for the power station. But obviously we have a contract for 26 years with the government, so I'm sure towards the end of 20 years we'll have another conversation about <laughs> about how long we can go. Yeah, so this is the next stage in the process. Obviously we, we stockpile uh, the peat in the fields and uh, when we need fuel for the power plant we bring it into this uh, storage shed where we can mix it for whatever composition we want. Different parts of the field have different properties. Some has more ash, some has less ash, different calorific value, more moist, less moist. So we mix it to the perfect composition for burning in the power station. And then we uh, transfer, there's a big hole in the bottom of the shed there with a huge conveyor system going up onto the tower where it's filtered and screened. So any stones or rubbish that's in the peats get filtered out. Very simple process, but it will be burning something like uh, a million cubes of peat annually. So they're the, uh, so like the tractors we have are Finnish, the, the, the peat max components come from Sweden and um, the, the boilers itself, the fuel, the, the fuel handling equipment comes from Andritz, a Finnish company. And then um, the turbines, the, the turbines uh, and the boilers and the, the turbine systems come from uh, Siemens. Wow. In Indian, you know, the major electrical yeah. power I know, plant I know supplier. some countries have started this technology ages ago. Yes. We have a country that has gotten its deposit depleted, and what did they do? Uh, I don't know of any country. It, okay. <laughs> it doesn't run out. A, yeah, okay. These countries, that's why they start there, because they have vast uh, quantities. But like some places they've converted to, like the plant we know in Estonia, um, is, a, is a quite similar to this one but it's converted to wood chips. So it imports wood chips from outside and burns wood chips instead. So it crushes the wood chips up. So a wood is a, obviously an alternative fuel. It's a, it's a biomass boiler, which means anything organic material you, you can burn in it pretty efficiently. Obviously, this is perfect material because it's fine. You can blow it into the boiler very easily and it will burn immediately. Um, so it's very efficient. From the peat hopper, uh, we've got two sheds, uh, shed one and shed two for redundancy. So you can um, have, uh, if one conveyor is on maintenance, you can use the other conveyor. 
uh, it travels up into the top of the tower where it's uh, filtered. The same structure as here, the same structure as the other That's correct, absolutely mirrored. All yeah. feeding into the, All feeding into the same channel. Yes. And then this is where the, uh, the conveyors in here are screening it for size, particles and foreign materials. Um, and then it comes out of the bottom as, as ready, ready to burn fuel onto the long travel conveyor going up to the top of the boiler house there where the fuel systems are. So uh, this end of the plant we find ourselves uh, on the water treatment systems. So this, this, this is a, uh, the, what we call the cooling towers. So the cooling towers are uh, for the heat sink. So when you're heating up, so when you're heating up water in the boiler, uh, you use the peat to heat the water, you turn the water to steam. Then the steam turns the turbine, goes through the machine, expands, and then after it, you take all of the energy out of the steam, it turns back to water again. So you have to uh, cool it down, the last little bit. So it cools down to about 45 degrees inside the condenser after the turbine, and you've got to get it back down to as low a temperature as you can um, to feed it back into the boiler again. So we use a huge heat sink called a cooling tower. And this is a, a thermal evaporative cooling tower with huge uh, variable speed fans, which force draft. So as the air is sucked in through the, as atmospheric air is sucked in through the fans, it passes directly over the water uh, droplets as they rain down into the tray. And this creates a, a, a direct contact heat exchanger, which is ultra efficient. So this is the water systems, cooling systems for the uh, uh, cooling systems for the turbine circulation system, and water supply systems uh, for the clean water for the boiler. Okay. So it can be burnt. Yeah. So uh, maybe at this point you can also break down the use of the water in the whole system, the combustion system, for the viewers to understand why this water. So the water is used for a number of so basically. You need the heat, the water is the heat transfer medium. So you have, to make electricity, you need a, a spinning motion. So the generator is spinning magnets, is, is, that is magnets inside a spinning field. If you spin a magnet inside an electric coil, you'll generate electricity. So the only thing we're trying to do is create spinning force. So in this power plant, you use uh, peat and, uh, to heat the steam to force through the turbine to create the spinning motion. In like a nuclear power plant, you, use, you still use steam, you still put steam through the turbine, but you use nuclear power to heat the water into steam. Um, in coal-fired power stations, the same. You're using the coal to heat the, uh, the water. So you're transferring the heat from the boiler, from the, you're tra making cold water into steam and because steam you can push through a turbine which will accelerate and spin this is the this is the only reason you need steam and so the water is used as the heat transfer medium to spin the turbine and then, and then the so the um, yeah so basically that's the uh, the steam in the boiler water condenser cooling tower so the process is heat the water in the boiler through the turbine condense it back to water cooling tower back into the boiler to heat up again into steam so it's steam water steam water steam water you. and you're literally extracting energy from that heat transfer oh. cooling systems you know uh, there's a lot of temperature our boiler is is uh, 500 degrees and 80 bar which is huge temperature you know almost on the material property limits of metal right so there's a lot of st hot stuff to cool down so we use um, some of the water for cooling things like generators, compressors, uh, lube boil pumps, uh, feed water pumps and so on. So a cooling system is very important for the water as well. Here this is uh, one of the main transformers um, that's connected to the electrical system of Rwanda. This is for uh, unit number two. It's a uh, 55 MVA transformer which will export all of the power from one of the units of the power plant to uh, the substation at the top uh, of the hill. So the substation uh, has been provided by Rwandan government 
Um, Rwanda Energy Group. That's correct. So they, they've invested um, in substations in uh, Bujisera, in Rulima, mm. and now Mamba. So this is a 100 kilometer, 220,000 volt transmission line, purely connected to this power station to export the power to the grid <coughs> and this is one of the uh, transformers okay. they regenerate power at 11,000 volts and uh, export so this, it at 220,000 rigs infrastructure so this, this the transformers actually we put this here they connected their scope finishes at this gantry mm. so they put the gantry down to our plant and then we put the transformer and connect onto the gantry so this, with power that's correct. To the grid. That's correct. Okay. So this is boiler one. Boiler two is the exact mirror of the system over here. So <coughs> basically the, what a boiler is, is, uh, is a hot box. It's a furnace where you um, throw combustible material inside in case, this, in, in this case it's peat, and you uh, ignite it. In this case we start to start the ignition with some diesel burners which gets the uh, boiler up to temperature. Bed temperatures are normally about 800 degrees. And then you throw the peat in and it spontaneously combusts, combusts just ignites. Uh, once you've got the uh, combustion rolling, you can switch off the diesel, uh, just like a pilot burner in a boiler, domestic boiler, you can switch off the pilot. Uh, stop burning the diesel and then the peat uh, carries on. And basically, as you increase the electrical load on the plant, the station auto control system automatically feeds more fuel into the boiler. <coughs> so, when you burn the peat, you get um, two different types of byproducts. You have bottom ash, which is heavier than the flow updraft in the boiler, which falls down into the bottom. And then you have fly ash, which is lighter than the airflow up through the boiler, which goes out of the top of the boiler. Um, so this is the bottom ash system. The fly ash system is uh, over here on the exhaust side. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Um, and then the water, uh, is, the water is heated inside the boiler in a series of tubes. There's uh, water panels going down. So the actual box of the boiler is made of water tubes that heat up the water and inside the top of the a boiler there are uh, heat exchanger tubes right. which the, where the fire basically vaporizes the water inside the uh, inside the tubes so talking of local local content in terms of uh, construction materials yeah how much and it's such a huge structure so how much of local content is on this facility and uh, how much of uh, imported content? Um, so uh, basically, uh, the, whole, the whole infrastructure such as the major components came from outside. So like the boiler materials, obviously there's no boiler manufacturer in Rwanda, so we, we have to get it from outside. But where we can, so pipe materials, uh, bolts, nuts, flanges, fittings, these kind of things that are made in Rwanda. Plastic pipe, domestic, uh, you know, water systems, and obviously manpower. We have uh, on the site at the peak, we had two and a half thousand people working on the site, and about That's four thousand five hundred. Yeah, and okay. about uh, four hundred of those were expats from outside Rwanda, providing skilled resources. The rest of them were Rwandans. So even even what, today what, we have. What, what will happen after permissioning? Will yeah. that number go down, or you? Keep so even today it's down. We have 550 people here today working on the site. Mm. About uh, 150 are expats, and the rest are locals. Okay. And actually, um, of the 550, 300 of them are actually neighbours. Mm. So they are displaced people where who were used to farm on the um, farmland. Uh, immediately adjacent to the site and they're now working directly for us with contracts and health benefits and, and all of this. Okay. So, so besides the factory, so the facility itself, how has the neighboring community benefited from this? So use, yeah. Use, use so yeah they used to they used to use the farmland, you know, yeah. subsistence farmers yeah. growing what they can growing what they can eat. Yeah. And obviously we've taken some of this land away from them. Yeah. Um, so we've helped them in terms of <coughs> giving them employment. We've created obviously lots of opportunities for locals to do 
um, you know, selling to the project. Lots of uh, restaurants, shops, obviously supply is huge. Keeping a workforce moving, just that in itself. Is so there are prioritized when you're giving. Exactly, jobs. exactly, exactly correct. And, uh, uh, and, and they have learned some skills. So now we have, you know, two, two, over 2,000 people who have been through the project. That's good stuff. Who are neighbors from as close, you know, for all from Butare, Gisagara, here, Mamba, Kabumwe, the local cells, who, who have now skills. You know, they have been exposed to a $400 million investment. So they know the kind of skills that they need. They know the kind of uh, w things that international projects want. And of course, other projects in the country will need this resource. Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, they will have the opportunities to, to go there and help. Um, what, what, about, what about the power? Because the big part of this district yeah. uh, doesn't have access to electricity. Has this project uh, supplied some power to... Uh, power actually, we, the, the, the region was electrified when we came, because obviously we need a lot of power during construction. So instead of the small networks that were here before, uh, a 33 kV transmission line was put into here to supply us for construction. And obviously this is now connected to all the local towns and villages in the local area. Yes. So just because we came, you see a lot of more customers. <laughs> okay. How about access roads? Did you do Access some? roads, yeah, actually government put the access road in for us okay. and they have a maintenance contract where we um, fund the upkeep of the road and um, yeah, the local government run the, run the road and, oh. and build the road. Okay. So this is where the peat comes from the conveyor into these uh, day storage tanks above our heads where the local supply of uh, uh, peat is stored down into the fuel racks and then into the, into the boiler itself. This is the exhaust gas cleaning system where we use uh, limestone to mix with the exhaust gases which scrubs the, uh, the emissions from the power plant. So in the top there's a huge bag filter. There's, uh, I can't remember how many, over 250 uh, bags which filter out the uh, particles, the fly ash from the exhaust gas. So very, very fine uh, particle separators. And then the gas itself is treated, uh, passes through this uh, heated reactor system, which uh, reacts it with uh, limestone, which takes all of the nasty uh, chemicals, sulfurs and uh, particles out of the gas itself to uh, help save the, uh, the locals are living around here and lower the contaminants from the plant. Uh, this is the main engine room of the power plant. This is uh, something you'll see in most uh, thermal power stations around the world. Uh, there are lots of cladding, um, lagging materials, the pipes to deliver the steam to the turbine. And then obviously this one is the generator end of the uh, main turbine generator unit itself. So this is a 11,000 kV, 11,000 volts uh, generator. Uh, I've rated at 40 megawatts at the terminal. So this, just this one generator here can power half of Rwanda at night time. So in the daytime, it'll be about a third. It can power, just one of the units can power a third of the country, the whole of Rwanda. Um, we have obviously two units, a mirror unit. This is unit one and we have unit two. This unit 40, is... 40 megawatts, 40 megawatts. 40 megawatts, 40 megawatts. Two times 40 80 megawatts, 80 megawatts. So we use some of the internal, we use some of the power for our own internal consumption, around five megawatts. So we should be able to export around 37, uh, 37 and a half megawatts per unit to the national unit. grid. So what we have here is, this is uh, turbine number one. Uh, we have from this end, we have the generating unit, which is making the electricity, which is basically a spinning magnet inside a coil of copper. You have a gearbox, which reduces the uh, speed to 3000 RPM for the turbine, which spins at 5000 RPM. So the turbine itself is uh, one piece. Uh, it's got a high pressure section with different stages down to low pressure. So by the time the steam comes out of the turbine itself, it's actually under vacuum, almost one atmosphere, absolute pressure. So similar, similar pressure to what's out in space. Because if you collapse steam 
through a machine by doing work, you, it uh, takes all of the energy out, which reduces it from 80 bar to zero bar absolute, so a pure vacuum. So basically, uh, as we saw the end of uh, turbine one here, we have exactly the same mirror of uh, turbine two. Slightly at a higher level, you can see all the feed and steam, uh, you can see, see the steam feed pipework going into the main turbine and then the electrical connections coming out into the electrical switchgear room. So what we have here is the electrical room. So every motor, every instrument, every panel, every light, every piece of machinery is fed from in this room. We have uh, even the connections to the national grid go out via this room onto the station transformers. So every piece of every facility. piece of equipment, everything, all the cables, all over this plant come into this room. You're every kidding. single one. You're kidding? Me. No. So this is where everything From is. The other side. Yes, yes, yes. Every single one comes into this room, so that we can control the motors, the controls, the uh, statuses. Anything goes wrong, uh, we can uh, respond, send operators here and investigate, and even switch over. So. There's lots of redundancy, so you have a, uh, if one breaker breaks, you can switch over to another one. Even the whole power plant is redundant. It flicks over from one supply to the other in less than one second, which keeps the power station running and adds reliability to the national grid. So that's another, you know, one of the, one of the benefits of this plant to the country is it's, it's, it's uh, a huge technology, lots of money has been invested in electrical uh, stability for grid uh, stability. So uh, when another power plant trips in, uh, in part another of the country and you have a blackout, we can keep running through this blackout for uh, three, four hours by the time the other plants sort themselves out and then we can all reconnect back to the grid again. So we've spent a lot of money on this uh, functionality for this project. So obviously, this is, uh, you can see the whole of the turbine hall, we have the maintenance crane, this is uh, turbine two and turbine one <coughs> with the generator, gearbox, turbine and condenser. This is the vacuum equipment on this end. This is where the money is spent and the money is made. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, unit one is commissioned uh, at the moment. Unit two is just going through its commissioning tests. Unit one is 40 megawatts? Yeah, this is 40 megawatts and uh, this one is also the same 40 megawatts. David, thank you so much for that tour. Yeah, very that good. Tour. Uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for the explanation. And we must congratulate you for the work well done. Yes, we're getting there now. Yes. <laughs> Now, then we go for the last mile. Yeah. Tell us about the key facts about this project. Okay, yes. so uh, basically there is uh, two shareholders, one London-based called Quantum, uh, one uh, Turkish-based called Hakan. Uh, they have uh, been investing the equity required to uh, uh, you know, complete the construction of the project. We have nine lenders. Uh, being headed by uh, AFC, the African Finance Corporation. They were the lead arranger and they've organized uh, $250 million of debt for the project. Um, <coughs> grateful to them as our partners. So total project cost in total is $400 million investment to get us to up to commercial operations. It's taken us uh, four years to construct and uh, actually it took longer five years to organize the financing for the uh, project to get from the initial contact with run the government to uh, interest to pricing discussions uh, power purchase agreements um, and then uh, organizing the financing with all the pre-feasibility the feasibility even we had to do one year operation on the peatlands to prove to investors that we could uh, produce the peat um, the what timelines? What timelines are you talking about? Up to the commissioning. So, so is the project on schedule? If it's not on schedule, no, we 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 are we are one year behind schedule that we're supposed to be. We had a number of delays, namely, obviously, we've had COVID, which has been shut us down for a little bit. We've had a couple of outbreaks on site. We've had some problems in the connecting countries' ports in uh, Kenya and Tanzania, where we had some equipment locked up for 
for six months in, even in one uh, some key equipment was locked up in Tanzania some problems with the contractor um, but in terms of you know we, we've had uh, some border issues uh, getting a large equipment across the border logistics in the country so altogether we're, we're about one year one year behind schedule which is uh, is not too bad but uh, when you have big loans it's difficult but <laughs> but as shareholders we've uh, managed to ride through the storm so what are the timelines when are we getting our hands off the project so the, the commission. so commissioning is happening now so unit one is ready unit two is under commissioning now then we'll have uh, one month of reliability testing and contracted capacity testing so Literally within six weeks, the, the power plant will be operating and generating revenues. Yes. Break, us down, break it down for us uh, in terms of the capacity of this facility. So how much power do you evacuate for the so, national grid? Yeah, so na national grid in Rwanda has got an installed capacity of 250 megawatts. For all the other sources, all the types of power that's being generated. So this power station is 80 megawatts. Which is, a, which is a significant increase in the country's, country's power. Uh, what it does do, it provides large generating units. So we have two 40 megawatt generating units, uh, which uh, are big uh, rotating masses connected to the national grid, which will provide a good stable base load power. So the idea is, not, is, is for us to connect and stay connected so that we're providing a backbone uh, an EUCL reg have provided the transmission line from Kigali, from Bugisera, out for, uh, to, to the new airport uh, there, uh, into Relima, and then down to Mamba. So we've brought new electrical infrastructure, new roads infrastructure, uh, all ready to um, export to the rest of the country. Uh, okay, uh, to Rwanda, Relima, Rwanda. Yep. What good news do you have for them? What is the impact of the social economic impact? So, from, from the, so total maximum workforce we've had on the site is approximately 2,500 workforce at the max peak of construction, building up <coughs> to 2,500 and coming back down. Today and during commissioning, we have about 550 people working, uh, and this will be uh, roughly the level uh, going forward for operations also because obviously we have to uh, harvest the peat. We, this is our own uh, company is harvesting the peat. So we are producing the peat and, and producing the power. So this is labor intensive activities. So going forward, we'll have about 550 to 500 people permanently employed. And obviously our responsibility for foreign direct investment is to make sure as much of this is top priority for Rwandans immediately in the local area because we have people who have been displaced living on the land and also farming the land so these are our top priority people um, who we we look after and we give priority to employment and services also we have to be good neighbors you know you need a social license to operate a facility like this so we have to we have to uh, interact with the community we have to take part in the community events we have to, uh, you know, we have to look after our neighbours. Just like there's a huge culture in Rwanda of looking after your neighbours, and we want to be part of this. The project is located right at the centre of a district. Yes. That is uh, uh, regarded as one of the poorest districts. Correct. With the low access levels to electricity. Correct. What impact is it creating? How so we during construction, um, we have obviously all of the power from this project goes to Kigali, where it's needed. You need generation in the places where it's needed. People, we want to build factories, want to create employment in and around. Uh, Kigali and Bujasera, uh, where the new airport is. But in itself, during construction, we brought a separate and a brand new power line, 33,000 kilovolts, <coughs> into the uh, Mamba sector, where people had just a normal small kind of transmission lines before. So we've increased the reliability of the electricity to the local population. Although it doesn't benefit from directly connecting to the power station it goes into the grid and they get it back by the uh, EUCL grid network okay as we close this interview uh, your experience as one of the experts working on the project yeah working in Rwanda 
and uh, we look forward to working on a similar project in the future. What has been your experience? Yeah, our experience. One and a half years. Yeah, so the things we've learned, obviously we've all learned about COVID. These things <laughs> have been a challenge. But Rwanda is a great place to work. It's, it's people want work, they want to have jobs. They, uh, the country is uh, clean, tidy, ease of doing business is fantastic. You know, investors can come, the rules, regulations uh, are very clear, not like other neighboring countries where I also worked, it's very <laughs> quite murky. Rwanda is very clear. Uh, access to uh, key decision makers is, is very good. They stand up, they be counted, uh, even down to local government level. There's a very good governance system set up in, uh, in Rwanda, which means even down in our little Kabumboy cell in the middle of nowhere, we feel connected to the rest of Rwanda. Thank you so much for this. We are so grateful. Very good. Have you?